Hey, welcome to the continuous profile. We were given microphones, so now it's like official. Richard, you know a lot about this stuff, right? You you know a lot about this stuff, right? This uh, continuous. Depends how you define a lot. <laughs> I don't know. So what did what did you all want to talk about? So my interest in this is from the perspective of. Uh, Again, uh, like with my SIG observability or tag observability hat on, um, continuous profiling is the next thing after metrics, logs, and traces, or logs, metrics, and traces, depending on where you're starting. But the usual user story I'm seeing is people uh, who are in like less evolved software systems tend to start with logs, then they go to metrics, then to traces. Sometimes they go logs, uh, traces, then metrics. But usually the common path is, is uh, for the new starters to be logs, metrics, traces. Whereas if you have more mature systems, either because people already have large installations, which they have been observing for some time, or uh, other things like network and such, infrastructure where people already had all those birthing pains which we are currently seeing in the observability space, they usually start with metrics because they already had this realization that it's a lot cheaper to reduce information into, into numbers. Either way, as we are dealing with more and more software, obviously, uh, preaching to the choir, I guess, um, after tracing comes co continuous profiling. That's something we see again and again and again with all my different hats on. Um, so that's why I'm here. I'm interested in, in how, to, how to make this work for the uh, generic case. We start with the tilde. With the what? A TLDR. Yeah, sorry. You mean of what continuous profiling is? Any volunteers, or should I? Google it. No. So okay. A profile is basically you look at at the structure of your running program. <sighs> It used, like the thing which is now often called a profile used to be called trace in Unix land, which kind of makes everything confusing, but from the, from the history or from how it's defined as of today is I take a, a snapshot of the current state of, of my system. How much time have I spent in X uh, function? How much memory is this and that thing using these kinds of things? Um, and going away from just a snapshot to doing this again and again and again and again and seeing how this changes over time, how this evolves. Maybe I'm in an error state, I'm seeing high latencies, I'm seeing this and that error. What is happening with, I don't know, my memory usage at the same time or my CPU or which function am I in? What is my hot path? What are the paths my code is usually running through? All those kinds of things. Uh, you can you can answer by by um, looking at the profile of a program again and again and again. With Go, you have it relatively easy. Of course, you have your your uh, prof endpoint or pre-prof endpoint, and you can just look at the thing. Um, other languages, it's not as easy. So initially, from the cloud native slash Go world, uh, continuous profiling used to be to just look at the pre-prof endpoint a lot and determine what changes over time and what desirable and undesirable behavior this, this um, correlates with. So, I mean, we use it for our services at AWS. We use PProf to profile our services, and we run it on a regular cadence, but we don't necessarily currently store it in any backend. It's all used locally, so we can access the information for PProf information. It's, a, it's the, the fourth signal of what you, what you do with it. Yeah. It's, not, it's not a, that's clear. I come from an APM background, so it's not a. For the recording, I think you need to. You need to go it. directly. Yeah, because yeah. else the people who are remote won't. You won't hear it. So it's, uh, 
It's the frequency of collection and then what do you do with the data afterwards, that profile information. Uh, some of the challenges we faced in the Ruby SDK is, uh, you know, we had a very a, a vendor specific implementation that had a continuous profiler and it ran in a, in a thread, in its own thread. So therefore it would get its own uh, context object and its own um, thread local variables. Whereas the main process, for example, that is um, uh, uh, running the operations or the request um, had all of its uh, context information in a separate thread and trying to share the information in between the the, the, the sampling profiler that's running in its own pthread and the uh, telemetry adult SDK running in a separate thread. We had to like essentially patch the context in order to give it access to the other to the other thread that's running. So some of the challenges in implementation at least on the Ruby side is that a, a, a challenge that other language implementations have faced or might face in the future? Like you, you, you do JS work, right? Yeah. Oh, of course. So everything's easy for you. <laughs> JMX. I mean, we, we touched on this a little bit in the session before. Um, there's, like we touched on this in a different context, but uh, still it's, it's a little bit the same story you have uh, languages where this is already built in like for example go you have languages where this is super hard like for example python and you have languages where you you have uh, something where you can at least tuck on in the middle java um, the thing which all of those have in common is they run on linux so uh, one of the things which i do think might make sense is again uh, looking at ebpf of course, there, all of a sudden, it's, it's uh, you, you see what, what function calls you see how often. And you see this, it doesn't matter if it's Java or if it's Ruby or if it's Go or if it's Fortran. Uh, you just see what, what you're hitting, how often you're hitting it, what time you're spending in between hitting those. You don't get the precise same depth of information. Mm -hmm. Like you wouldn't get what Go's pprof gives you just out of the box. Um, but I also strongly believe that over time eBPF will be enabled to, to carry more context from user space into kernel space, maybe attach a label to a syscall or something to, to actually be able to transport information more or less for the inten explicit intention to, to just signal to eBPF and at that point um, you don't need to do this in Ruby or in what have you. The other thing is, uh, in particular in scripted languages and such, implementing those kinds of things as part of the language tends to become super expensive. And if you look at, I think the paper from IBM is from the 70s about how much how much effort and time you and money you should be spending on, on I think they didn't even use the term monitor, but whatever, like on the same concept, which like the same underlying desires and concepts which we are still dealing with today, they came out at 10 to 20%. If you look at actual, actual research, um, that tends to be those magic 20% tend to be the cost which you're allowed uh, to invest and also what you should invest to, to get good, uh, good outcome. And it's a lot easier to do this in, in the Linux kernel than, for example, in Ruby. And not, like, go to 50% or something of your total cost. There was, an, as an anecdote, uh, a nameless company working on a nameless, uh, like, it's not Grafana, but like, I heard about this through, it wasn't us, but, um, they were running something serverless and cool and blah, blah, blah. And they realized that over 50% of what they were actually paying for in CPU time was just service mesh. And they realized this with continuous profiling. This is not an amount of money you should be spending on your service mesh. Same goes for your observability stack. Ooh. 
Yeah, but was, I mean, that, was that a configuration issue though, or was that a particular type of environment that was, or, or applications or workloads that were running on service mesh that was causing this, or? I, I think how they called it or what amount of data they, they sent in and out, it's, I, I don't have the details, like I'm, I would be making stuff up at this point. It was like it was user error or programmer error of how they how they interacted with with the endpoint or with the APIs. But I don't know the details. But this is the type of thing to come back to the TLDR, which is relatively easy to find with continuous profiling. Of course, all of a sudden you're getting those insights and you used to be able to do this uh, with like classic systems a jet attach gdb and and go to town uh, like in 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 more when you had different uh, containments for your complexity i guess I, I come back to the the continuous profile but you you matched it back up to the ebpf and how do you correlate the two between user space or or system calls and, and be able to say that this is using the aggregate of all these calls are actually what's contributing to uh, your resource usage or your memory. I would think that would be the correlation between the span and trace data, whatever the, the span and the trace data, for example. The asset level. No. You can't, no. No, you don't have it at that level, though. Yeah, yeah. So you don't. Yeah. So you were suggesting that, if I'm not mistaken, Richard, that a change were happened. Yep. Just to reiterate what I thought I heard you say, Richard, is that you you can see this coming or you're predicting that this might happen in ebpf is that they'll add the ability to add custom labels which would give us the ability to pass the trace id and span id context to it. But isn't it aggregated information uh, that's so, yeah, that's aggregated on what aggregated, aggregated in such a way that uh, an individual trace id or span id is irrelevant in the common case, it will be irrelevant. And also, I like in all of the things we are talking about, you'll usually have aggregations, uh, logs, and uh, and traces are not precisely following this. But anything else which you're seeing is basically already aggregations, like metrics and continuous profiling and others. Of course, it's just super expensive to not have aggregates, uh, and you need to go to aggregates as soon as possible. And you see this in humanity's history again and again and again and again. Um, that you, you want to have this level of detail and then you realize you actually don't want to pay for this and then you, you start putting numbers and such against things. Uh, I think that A, yes, if like in my mind, at some point I do think that there will be more, uh, more possibility to actually talk to eBPF, so to speak. But also the other thing, um, and now we are back at this correlation of signals and uh, having unified alerting, single pane of glass, blah, blah. I, I don't need to tell you that I actually drank this Kool-Aid and, and believe in this stuff, because else I wouldn't be working where I'm working at. Um, if I see my latency spike, I know when that happened. And I can look at my continuous profiles to see what they looked like before, after, and during this thing. Or I see this and that error suddenly is spiking. I don't have to extract all of this information from my continuous profiles. I absolutely do not. I'm actually, I would actually argue somewhat strongly that both continuous profiling and traces shouldn't be carrying all this depth of information. Because I already have my aggregates, which are the metrics, and I already have my specific incidents, which I care about, which are my logs. And those already carry the meaning. And like for example, when you look at, um, so for, for open metrics, when we talked to Google, uh, in, I, I forgot when, uh, we were talking about how to do this for other types of signals, like apply the things which Prometheus does for others, uh, blah, blah, blah. And they said something which really stuck with me that it is not efficient to search for traces. And when Google tells you that searching for something doesn't scale, you better listen. And what they did is exemplars, and that's what you now find in open metrics, it's what you find in Prometheus, it's what you find in Loki, it's what you find in others. They have an ID to a trace, and you only need this ID, because the thing is, uh, if I'm ingesting all my traces with all the, the raw metadata, I need to actually distill meaning from this again. And it's super nice to be able to, do, to slice and dice this as, as I want at runtime, but it's super expensive. 
there's I already have my information that hey this and that uh, latency is spiking or this and that error is spiking then just by attaching those exemplars I know I can jump into the trace I have the mental context I can jump into the thing I can look at it yeah. and the same is true not with specific traces but at least with time and what machine and what what fleet of what service and what have you is true for continuous profiling of course I all of a sudden I can say, okay, I have this and that thing. It's in undesirable state. How do my profiles look? It made me think, so I'm jumping into this. Thank you. So I was jumping into looking at what the proposal actually was for the, what's in the OTEP to describe a bit about how they want to do any sort of correlation whatsoever with tracing. And maybe uh, I was wondering if there was something in here that I could quickly look up. But uh, this is talking about doing correlation with PROF. And then I was looking at like, well, I could have sworn that I saw that Pyroscope had support for tracing integration. That's also PPROF, not eBPF. So these are all PPROF is Go specific. And I would strongly agree that Go is, is the default in cloud native. But if you sure. look at, sure. uh, for example, their, um, their metrics is going first within open telemetry, it's Java and C or C hash. Because uh, that's where the most users are, and uh, it's nice to have PPROF. And I mean, I like PPROF. Yeah, but it's completely and utterly useless to someone using Java. But is Yeah, I don't know. I've I've looked at the PPROF protobuf definition just for less than a half hour total. Is uh, is it? Standard enough, where it's it's language and technology agnostic. Is it only useful in the? Is it useful for like the continuous profiling situation where you're trying to compare multiple profiles over time? Uh, should it just? I guess I, I don't understand about. It. I want to learn more about it and okay. whether it's a good candidate to to use as the as the uh, the data transfer type. Pprof itself is really good. Um, and it's, in my opinion, in my strong opinion, standardized enough to, to just use for different languages. And if you were to magically have your GVM or whatever emit PPROF compatible uh, data, you would make a lot of people very happy. And you already have an ecosystem around this which just integrates super well. Um, it also would mean that anyone who, who, who um, yeah, no, long story short, if other languages were to speak PPROF, mm -hmm. I do think this would be a tremendous benefit for the whole ecosystem. I generally strongly, very extremely strongly believe that uh, open standards are the most important thing about, about anything which we're doing, because technologies come and go, uh, implementations come and go, but if you if you look at how how like ISO OC layers um, without those the internet would not exist. You still can read out old Modbus installations from 30 years ago, SNMP installations from 20 or 30 years ago, with the same protocols because you have those open standards. And even if your implementation is is literally 30 years newer, it still interoperates. So yes. Having Java emit PPROF uh, type um, profiles would be awesome. So, so why isn't that then? Is it because of the overhead that it had? I don't know. Talk to any? Yeah. To, to, I mean, I, I, I'm not a Java person. Yeah. Um, I would, I would, personally, I strongly believe that having a standard here would be great, and PPROF is best suited to, to be a standard, which is arguably outside of the scope for for open telemetry, but. Um, I mean, in the end, we care about having the functionality, uh, and this is probably the quickest way to have this. At least looking at 
for example, one of uh, PPROF is what is uh, the, the Datadog APM, which is what um, was donated to Hotel Ruby, and that's where we're extracting our implementations from. The profiler that's been built into that is using PPROF to, um, hmm. to export data. So that might be an opportunity or that might be how it would have what it might evolve for Ruby. I'm looking at this other comment here added by Peter Pete the Pig about Pyroscope. And it talks about utilizing RB spy uh, to do that. Not, not that this is an exploration moment for Ruby for all of you. Sorry to hold you hostage here. But uh it's just curious because I'm looking at all these different comments. Sorry in there. I figure that might be an interesting point. But it seems to align closely to a, what might be feasible for us at least. So did they donate it and then hands off or are they actually actively working on this? We do not currently have any Ruby engineers from Datadog assigned or maintaining the project. We did have one but they moved on to go work somewhere else. Okay. So, and then they st stopped you know, maintaining and stuff. Okay, Petty, because what you said initially sounded like this could be, okay, it is what it is. Yeah. We're over time. All right, well, I like going over time because we start late. Yeah. Wait for everyone to have a conversation, right? I mean, <laughs> we're just a fraction of the, the folks that are interested in, in, in profiling. I think the initial call had like 60 people on it, and so. We're, we're doing some hackathons internally and some internal intern projects on, on PPROF and evaluating Periscope versus Profife and other ones. So we're trying to gather the best way to do continuous profiling. So happily, we'll share some of the results with the rest of the community as soon as we get that data. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I'll, I'll pay close and the thing is you always have this initial influx of people who, who are interested because they heard about it. Um, most people don't stick around to do the actual work. <laughs> that's, the, that's the issue. It's like, you know, you turn the lights on and the books <laughs> no, it, It's more like you need to actually have commitment for this. Like long term, well, you, need to find, you need to find the value, right? If, you, there's, if there's value, then you'll build it. But if there's not really a value that you've proven with later, and that's, that's the thing, I mean, that's where AWS, we're always working backwards from customers. If the, the customer asks for it, we'll build it. But if there's still, still, I would say, very infancy stages to be able to go and build these things, so it's not, that's why the, the demands are just not there, and nobody's proven the value, so it's a. Um, the chicken and egg thing, right? I would say the value is there, but it's not easy to, to prove. And also you need to anticipate, like the customer needs to tell you what they already know they want. That's not the visionary approach. That's like the, I'm, I'm this like more stop gappy approach to some extent. Richard, thank you very much for participating. Nice to meet you. Same.